say you are a God-fearing people, surely you would have to embrace repentance. And today, it is absolutely evident that if a repentance would be brought before the Lord, right from the clergy, and I'm talking here about the priesthood, the bishops and the pastors. We have seen in the recent past that something for sure must be amiss. Something does not add up even in the practice of the church. There are those who say the church should be the salt of the earth, nay, the salt of the state. Yet there have been murmurs of corruption and nepotism in the church. Kenya, being supposedly 70 to 80 percent Christian, has a parliament and civil service that is predominantly Christian in composition. Yet, year in, year out, Kenya scores dismally on corruption indexes. It begs the question, are we all thieves minus opportunity? Prophet Dr. Uwar has stood out from the crowd, castigating the men and women of the clock about how they handle money from congregants. Devoid of the corruption that you see in the church today, they sow a seed here today and buy you a miracle. They sow a seed here to receive deliverance. Once the church will have chosen the highway of holiness and righteousness and rejected that form of corruption, then the entire nation will honor her word. Many times he has been the lone voice speaking about corruption in high places, in church, about lost morals and unethical practices. Our guest today is Prophet David Edward O'War of the Repentance and Holiness Church. And we come to you moving the masses. Our question is, the state of corruption in a God-fearing nation. We claim in this country times without number that we are Christians. Yet year in, year out, we perform badly in matters of corruption. Is our Christianity only mouth deep, skin deep, prophet? Welcome. Thank you. Tell me our claim to Christianity. How can we reconcile it with our creed, which is greed? Thank you so much, uh, Professor. What a great opportunity even to be able to be hosted by your precious program. Now, you ask a very central question at a very critical time in the history of this nation. We have seen the tremendous decay that has eaten into the fabric of this society. It is absolutely obvious to every Kenyan today that something is decaying, that the nation does not seem to reflect the image of what he says. And the way you frame your question when you say the state of corruption in a God-fearing nation, I don't think there would be a more, a more peak conversation in your moving the masses, a conversation that would stir up uh, the urge for the nation to look for the cause you know, we see the symptoms of the decay, but I'm talking about the cause of decay that includes corruption in this land. And so, like you rightfully put it, Kenyans pride themselves 
of some statistics that uh, they say over 70% Christian. And in the basic definition of Christianity, those are Christ followers and essentially God-fearing people. But then how come it does not add up to the fact that the countenance, the appearance she presents is different from a God-fearing nation? And that's why I'm saying uh, the bottom of this issue is going to revolve back, back to the church. I am going to look at the real basics today as to why, why a precious nation like Kenya would eventually just degenerate to the extent that corruption becomes now a vice that somehow is malignant. I mean, I don't see any control anymore. And top to this, a lot of other practices. I mean, there is a lot of uh, moral, you know, moral animosity, so to say. The moral not caring, you know, the state of neglect, the great disconnect between the people at the helm of leadership and the people at the grassroots. Now, I want to bring it to your precious notice today that the church, the church of Christ in the nation of Kenya, the Lord ordained the church, Professor. He ordained the church as the light of the nation. In fact, the Lord says in the book of Matthew that the church is the salt of the nation, the salt of the earth. I hear you. We will continue. But what I want to hear from you, we have one of the largest denominations of Christian churches in the whole world. On Sunday we pray. Yet in every sector, and I dare say even in the church, we accept tithes from known thieves. Do you see what I describe as a, let, a latter day Pharisaic behavior amongst our clergy? Thank you so much. It couldn't have been better put already. You've jumped ahead of this curve. Uh, so the decay, I want to bring to the attention, to the notice of this nation, that the decay that you see in this society today, it is a decay that is a derivative. It derives its origin from the state of the church. And if I were to put it plainly to you in layman terms, uh, when you see a church that is decayed, that is rotting, then obviously you will correspondingly find a nation that is decayed. So the, 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 the corruption that you are seeing today manifesting in the national scene in different uh, spheres of this nation, that corruption has its origin from the, moral, the spiritual corruption in the church. I mean, the church ought to be the leader, the moral authority today, even as this nation is wandering about looking for direction. And that's what I meant when I said that the church is the light of the nation, even as ordained by the Lord. Now, the failure, Professor, the failure of the church to rise up to her calling, in fact, this is her responsibility, to rise up to her calling as the moral leader, even reflected in the malpractice that you see in the house today, in the sanctuary of the Lord. You see the church now more focused on money, they are preaching a gospel that is perishable, a gospel that does not augur well with her authority, even as she's supposed to earn it from the people. If you see a church that is once here and there reported in sexual sin, even the clergy, if you see a church that delves, jumps into raw politics, unprocessed politics, instead of fighting to walk right with the Lord, I mean, I see a state of irony here because you hear many times the church leaders saying, look, we are fighting this in the Constitution, for example, because we want the will of God to be manifest in this land. But I also want to bring to your precious attention as a very uh, mighty nation, supposedly in this region, that surely there is no better way in which to bring the nation 
back to the will of God except through repentance. And I'm talking about the turning away from sin, the complete shunning of evil, and I, I hear, I hear you on that point. You'll, you'll continue on that point. But Kenyans want to hear you very specifically. You've been on record as saying, number one, that in your own ministry you don't accept what we call sadaka. But there is a sense in which the Kenyan church, and I'm using the word here in contradistinction to the clergy, are sometimes intimidated. If you don't pay 10% tithe, you are stealing from God. Exactly. If you don't do this, you are stealing from God. And the clergy say, we are speaking in the name of the Lord. How do you then confront individuals who invoke the name of the Lord, yet appear to condone things that are corrupt? Thank you so much. What a better way to put it. Now, I want you to understand, Professor, that uh, the Bible is wholesome. The Bible is the final authority to life even as created by Jehovah. The Bible indeed talks about tithe, all those things that they invoke. But I want also to bring to the attention of the clergy, of the people of Kenya, that the central calling of the church is to preach Jesus of Nazareth, to preach righteousness. And that is the light that she ought to emit. And all these things the Lord says, he will add unto the church. God says, I'm not here to humiliate the church. He says, I'm not here to humiliate the clergy that you may be impoverished, that you may be, you know, put in a state of shame. He said, I will take care of your needs, but preach the centrality of the gospel, which is the light, the light of Christ, which is righteousness. Reject corruption. Rebuke sin. And so when you see the church focusing more into how much money people bring, really, it is a reflection of the apostasy in the house, in fact, in the clergy. And that's why you see even the politicians in this land. At times you wonder whether to lay the blame on the politicians or on the clergy. Because even the politicians of the land and members of the civil service, I mean those that you have so much spoken about, having been engaged in corruption, in malpractice, they were brought up by their mothers. Their mothers somehow took them to church, took them to the house of the Lord. They are products of the church. But and in the church, they ought to have been taught the right thing, such that when they come within the helm of leadership, they ought to have known what is right, what you ought to do and not to do. I hear you, prophet. My problem is this. To their credit, all these clergy say the right thing. When I hear them, they invoke the right things. They quote the Bible. And it, it looks so genuine. But there is a sense in which they do not touch the minds and hearts of the Christians because we are Christians on a Sunday like this. Beginning Monday tomorrow, we are asking for bribes everywhere. We are cutting deals everywhere. And everybody is asking, this kind of Christianity, is it the kind of Christianity that Christ said many will be called and few chosen? Are we the ones that will not be chosen, but yet we are called? Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, in that very context, I want to essentially hit the nail, the, the hit on the top of the nail, by saying that in Kenya today, there is a fall in the church. In fact, the fall is so evident that you don't need to come out and describe to people. The most recent events that have transpired at Uhuru Park, where you see the church that is supposed to have been speaking to Jehovah, calling for a meeting, supposedly a prayer meeting, and then the same Jehovah that they purportedly said they would talk to, they would pray to, does not even tell them that calamity is going to befall.